introduce Troy Hearn, our state white head coordinator, road biker, mountain biker, trail known, and a musician, and all around good family guy. I think I heard some people booing in there, but that's, like, that's, that's a problem somebody out there. Okay, I'm going to throw a whole lot of information out at you guys. Everything's related to bicycling and walking and all of the planning elements that you need to know about it. Uh, one of my many jobs is I work with the uh, transportation cabinet. I'm the uh, bicycle and pedestrian program coordinator. Yes, that is a real job. A uh, little bit of uh, history about myself. Uh, the pedestrian world, uh, I started walking when I was about 10 months old. Uh, I started talking soon after that. Surprise, surprise, right? Uh, so I've been a pedestrian since I was 10 months old. Most of you guys, everybody's a pedestrian. You got out of your car and you walked in here and you used a nice sidewalk. So a lot of times for pedestrian issues, we take that for granted. Uh, mainly before I started in my job now, I uh, just thought of myself as a bicyclist. Uh, when I was six years old, I got my first bicycle. It was a uh, Schwinn Stingray wannabe. I think it was a Humvee something. Uh, but it was bright red and it had the big handlebars and it had the big banana seat and I was very, very cool on it. Uh, so at six years old, I dropped the walking and I got into bicycling. And uh, for the most part, I was a crazy fanatic kid on my bike. Uh, I don't remember a whole lot of my bikes because they were bikes that me and the neighborhood kids just put together. And as long as it worked uh, and it rolled to my friend's house, or to school or whatever. I was one of the crazy kids that walked or rode my bike to school uh, pretty much all the way up until I turned 16. Like a lot of 16 year olds when I got my car, uh, you know, I kind of ditched the bike. Uh, but if I didn't have money for gas or something was wrong with my car, guess what? I would go and get my road bike. Uh, I got my first road bike when I was in sixth grade. It was a, a Huffy Santa Fe. I remember my dad dropping me off at the big hill near my house and he said, ride it home. And I was like, all right. Well, I'd never ridden a road bike in sixth grade. Uh, it had the suicide brake levers. If you were really old, you remember those, the little secondary brake levers. And uh, I don't know how fast I went that day, but I thought I was going 60 miles an hour. Uh, so there was a couple years where I didn't ride at all. Uh, you know, I drove a car everywhere, you know, which a lot of kids do. Uh, but when I was about 18 or 19, a friend of mine let me borrow a mountain bike. And this was like in 1987, like a long time ago. And uh, those mountain bikes were fairly new then. Uh, but it reminded me of the BMX bike that I had as a kid. Then I was hooked on mountain biking. Uh, then soon after that, I got another road bike. And then uh, we worked in the bicycle industry for about 17 years. I've uh, worked at bike shops, I've owned bike shops. I've, I've pretty much have done everything in the bike world that you could do. And then lo and behold, somebody said, there's a job uh, being a bicycle and pedestrian uh, planner. Uh, and it's for the transportation kind of, you should inter interview for it. And I did, and I uh, wasn't their first choice, I was their second choice. Uh, but the lady that took the job after a month said, I don't want the job. So they called me up, and lo and behold, I ended up in the job. Uh, never really worked in a uh, government world, uh, and uh, lo and behold, they can handle me. Uh, it's, a, uh, <laughs> it's exciting for them as much as it is for me every single day. Uh, so now I'm in the world of planning for anything, bicycling uh, or walking, and any element to that. Take it away, you know. Okay, so when we talk about bicycling and walking, uh, bicycling can be road biking, commuting, uh, just riding around your neighborhood, mountain bike, really anything on wheels. You know, one wheel, two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, uh, we deal with all that. Uh, so with bicycling, you've got so many different kinds of bikes and so many different kind of bike riders. Uh, so you have to deal and plan with uh, all of those folks in the run. With walking, primarily you would think, well, we're all walkers. But there's little kids that walk, there's you know, folks like this that they're completely physically able to pretty much uh, step over things and do all the things that you deal with when you're walking. But then you also have folks with uh, mobility devices and wheelchairs. So with, uh, with the walking world, when you're planning, you have to plan for all of those different folks in the bike world and in the pedestrian world. You know? Why do you need to plan for bicycling or walking? You can walk anywhere, right? You can bicycle anywhere, right? Who here has ever ridden their bicycle to Fayetteville to go shopping? You guys are insane. And I'm one of those people. I've done it. And there's no bike racks. And when I rode there, there was no, I don't know if there is now, but there's no bike racks if you go to Fayetteville. So Nicholasville Road here in Lexington is a prime example of, is that me? Okay. 
that's the beer. Okay. So Nicholsville Road is a prime example of uh, bicycling and walking were not thought of when they play in that road and that corridor. Uh, engineers that I work with are all awesome people. They're civil engineers or highway engineers. They are all awesome people. The schools that they go to around the country to teach them what they need to know are fixing problems. And the problems are all centered around the mobility of automotive traffic whether it be cars or trucks, anything with a motor. Uh, that's the way our country has planned for mobility uh, since the end of World War II. Uh, some countries, uh, Finland, Norway, a uh, lot of those parts in Europe uh, after World War II, they built motorized infrastructure back because a lot of their infrastructure was gone from the war, got blown up. Uh, but they also had a lot of emphasis on bicycling and walking. I saw Amsterdam as a, as a prime example. Uh, when they started to rebuild their country and their infrastructure in the 1940s and 50s, 40 percent of the money they've spent over the last 80 years has been on bicycling and walking facilities. So therefore, guess what, they have a 40 plus percent mode share for people bicycling and walking for all of the small trips they do. Uh, I have been overseas and they can point out that American right away because I've got my full outfit on, I've got my helmet on, and and I'm just going at it, you know. They have speed limits on the uh, Syracuse Paths in Amsterdam. They're anywhere from 8 to 15 miles an hour. And yes, they will give you a ticket uh, for that. Uh, you cannot outrun them now because they're on high-powered electric bikes, the police. <laughs> and they can go really, really fast. Uh, I may or may not know that person. Uh, but they spot, spot you out. In uh, European countries and other parts of the world, in Australia, uh, when they bicycle, they bicycle to work, they bicycle and walk to, uh, to the store, and that's how they get their physical activity. A lot of us, myself included, uh, you know, I get up, I drive to work, I sometimes commute to work, I have about a five mile ride to work. Uh, but then I drive home, and then I drive to go ride my bike. You guys all drove here, a few of you commuted here, which is awesome. And if it's convenient, and you live close enough, then we do commute a lot of times. A lot of us are in the two to five percent of the population that feels safe enough to ride out on the road with traffic, with motorized traffic. You guys are kind of the exception to the rule. Uh, so a lot of bike planning that I do, uh, working with communities, I tell them they have to spend their time and energy for the most part not planning for us. Because we're already the, the crazy fearless folks that will ride out on the roads. We pick the roads that we ride on based on our comfort level. Uh, I know uh, years ago we did a, a group ride on a US 62. It's in between, uh, I think it's US 62, it's a Midway Road. And uh, it was from Purcell's Road to like Midway on the interstate. Pam Thomas is with me. And we, I picked this route because I rode it all the time. But apparently Pam informed me on the ride when she was behind me this road was too busy for us to put on a group road ride. So if you guys have ever ridden with Pam, she can be very adamant about that. So we picked the roads that we're going to ride on based on our comfort level. But a lot of folks, about 85% of our population, won't ever ride their bikes on roads with motorized traffic. So places like the Legacy Trail and those other things is what really we try to plan for the most. So why is local planning needed? And really the power for planning for better bicycling and walking uh, is, the, you, is you guys. Every time I use the word uh, we, they, us, them, people, you guys are those people. You guys are now in charge of this. So if you look at working with uh, where I work at the highway department, uh, engineers are usually problem fixers. And they have been given the problem. The problem, what they think is uh, moving motorized traffic more efficiently and safer. And that is the number one problem in front of them. They're excellent at what they do. That's why we in Kentucky have one of the best roadway systems in the country. We have some of the best pavement quality in the country. So for doing what we do, we're very good at it. At a state level, what they think the problem is, moving motorized traffic as fast and safe as possible. So this is what's happened over the last 80 years. Mode share, 76% of all the trips is one person driving in the car by themselves. If anybody has kids, we have these things called the car line now, it's insane. When I was a kid, you either took the bus or you rode or you, you uh, walked to school if you lived close enough. And, they had, and I don't remember them having a bike rack. I don't remember what I did with my bike when I went to school back in the 
the 70s. I guess we just lean them up against something that nobody's goal. Uh, so, but this is why it's important for local communities to know that if you want this dynamic to change, the power and the responsibility is yours and your local community. Okay, okay so this is a little bit over exaggerated. We can list maybe Lexington and Wolf at some point in time. You see, this is what our streets look like today. Because the mode shift is 98% of all the users of our transportation infrastructure must be in motorized vehicles. So this is what we've done. And to accommodate the peak traffic times, we make everything super wide and super crazy. So when it's not a peak traffic time, imagine if you're somebody in a, a walker or a, a, a wheelchair, or if you're just a slow walker, you know, but that's a lot of distance to cross, and there's a lot of common points there. Uh, so if we want to change that, and I'll show you how to do that, uh, we can. Okay, here's another condition. The, the one was kind of more of an urbanized environment. Uh, this is the rural environment. A lot of times we're road riders, we're out in the rural roads a lot. Uh, if there is a shoulder, guess what? It's full of debris a lot of times. The way our state law is written, if you're a road rider, you're operating on the road, which you are an eagle vehicle. Uh, you are to ride as far right as practicable on the roadway. And the roadway includes all of the paved surface that's out there. So if there's a paved shoulder, legally you're supposed to ride as far right as practicable. So if you ever get pulled over and they say, y'all, you weren't riding or you were out on the roadway, well, officer, I was riding, you always be nice respectful to the police officers. They're awesome people. But uh, you can inform them, I was riding as far right as practicable. There was debris in the shoulder and I could not use that portion of the shoulder. Uh, but as soon as there's no debris there, you can get out of there. Uh, and when the shoulder is clean, and it's hard to see in this picture right here, this is a fellow that was doing the uh, ride across America a couple years ago. He came in fourth. I forget his name, but uh, and part of the ride across America uses the Trans America route, and it goes right through Kentucky, 491 miles up through Kentucky. But he said we had some of the best roads he had ever ridden in the world. He says the only issues were the dogs and the rumble strips. Uh, because in Kentucky, about four years ago, we started using a more aggressive rumble strip. You know why? Because everybody's on their phones. And so they make these crazy rumble strips when you're on your phone and you drift over in the rumble strip. You know, you know, from, okay. See, the engineers have a problem. Every, the number one reason for departures and wrecks is because people are distracted. So that's the problem. So what they do? They fixed it. They put this big, deep rubble strip in there for you. But did they think about bicyclists? No. Initially, no. But uh, starting last year, the transportation cabinet has a new policy. They put a 10-foot gap every 40 to 50 feet in the rumble strip. If you look at Richmond Road, Alabama, uh, that was one of the first ones they did in the state. So we do a lot of progressive things. Uh, I'm going to show extreme pictures and, ex and extreme examples for a lot of things. But in the last six years, our transportation cabinet uh, has done a huge effort. We have one of the best bike pit programs in the country now because of that. Okay, so here's your rural conditions. Uh, you can see, look, they had good intentions here. The sign says, this space dedicated for bicycles. And look where the sign is, it's in the bike lane. Okay. Uh, but you can see a lot of rural conditions. For the most part, we have awesome roads here. Uh, the bike clubs, largest bike clubs in the state, have done an awesome job of educating themselves. We do not have a statewide uh, bike uh, advocacy club for the most part, uh, but we have awesome huge bike clubs like the Bluegrass Cycle Club, Louisville Bike Club, uh, Owensboro, uh, the Ashland area. So the, uh, you can see right here Tom Helmet. I think that's uh, Adam Adair right behind him. And that was just a random picture taken a couple years ago. But look, all these cyclists are operating legally. You can operate one or two side by side. They're riding pretty far right to the road. These guys are like pros. They're like a machine. Uh, when we promote cycling on our website uh, at work and everything that we do, we always want to promote the riders riding legally and responsibly out on the road. Sorry. Okay, so the power is for communities uh, and individuals just like yourself to plan for these things. You work with your local government, your city government, your county governments, uh, your magistrates. If you see something that needs to be fixed or improved, you can work with these folks to change those things. Dr. Dixie Moore right here, 
She's a pit bull cycling advocate. And I gave her a few more top tips. One, one person, one person got a state ball changed. So it only took three years, about thousands of hours. Uh, but uh, so imagine what a whole room of people could do. Uh, so when I have talked with communities over the years, uh, I started at the transportation cabinet in 2012. There were seven communities that had a documented plan of what they wanted, where they wanted it, and how it fit in their master vision for bicycling and walking, uh, anything really, mobility, uh, mainly transportation. Uh, although a lot of communities include recreational cycling in their planning, and I'll discuss that in a little bit. So like I said, in 2012, there were seven communities that had a document that said this is what we need to do. Uh, now in 2018, we have 57 communities that have an official plan of what they want, where they want it, how it makes sense. Uh, this is just one of the maps on the uh, KYCT uh, uh, bike walk website. Uh, if it's a little dot, uh, then the city has a plan, like the city of Frankfurt has an awesome bike walk plan that was just updated. Uh, my friend Nathan right here is one of the folks that helps with that at Walk Bike Frankfurt. Uh, but it's really just a city plan. Uh, we do have some planning elements that go out of the county, like we have some shared use paths that kind of extend out of the county. But for the most part, it's a city plan. Uh, in Lexington, uh, Lexington has a, Le a Lexington city specific plan, but Lexington is also an MPO, a Metropolitan Planning Organization, because they're a big urban area. So they have a Fayette County and Jesmond County plan as well. So they cover those two counties. Uh, but that's just all the areas uh, that have a documented plan. Uh, up until a couple years ago, we didn't have anything in far western Kentucky. Uh, but those guys, uh, to quote from Bill, from Bill Gordon, uh, they've been on fire for the last couple of years. Uh, a lot of folks think of southeast Kentucky being the coal area. And the coal industry's kind of dried up uh, quite a bit in the last 10 years. But not only is the southeast area of Kentucky coal area, but far western Kentucky uh, is also a coal area. So a lot of their income has dried up. So they're gravitating to anything they can do to help their communities uh, be more uh, better places to live and have any kind of tourist activity. Yeah. You can also see the far south and the eastern part of the state there. Uh, there's not a lot of planning going on. Uh, well, what those folks have been doing right down near uh, Prestonsburg and uh, uh, Bell County, some of those other areas, they have not really documented like a master plan of what they want to do. These guys just go do it. Uh, the mayor of Prestonsburg, his crew down there in Floyd County, Johnson County, the Dawkins line, if you've never known that, I'll mention that a little bit later, but the Dawkins line is awesome. Those folks don't have a documented plan, but they've just been going out there doing it, building it, they've been doing some great stuff. So, But I've still been trying to get on to make those documents because once a community has a plan, and it's uh, vetted, it's in their comprehensive plan, going through the, the cycles of planning and building. Once you have that document, it outlives the people. Uh, my fear is like those folks in Prestonsburg and Southeast Kentucky, they're doing great stuff right now, but you know, what happens in 20 years if they're going, you know, that, that work needs to continue. Okay, so uh, when I started in 2012, uh, I noticed that uh, one of the first things is we have a very well documented. Uh, pedestrian and bicycle travel policy. Uh, with the transportation cabinet, there's about 11 steps uh, or considerations that the transportation cabinet uses when they decide whether or not sidewalks, bike lanes, or a multi-use path is going to be built as part of a project. One of the most important considerations is, does the community have a plan for what they want? If you live in a community, and you don't have a plan for what you want for bicycling or walking, then you're going to rely on those higher level folks to make your decisions. And like I said earlier, what do they think the problem is? Moving cars, trucks, you know, the safety and the speed and the efficiency for that. So they aren't going to necessarily think of the active transportation modes. So the, the responsibility lies on the community. So the other things on that checklist are, is there a facility there now? Well, if there's already a sidewalk there and they do work on the road, they're going to make the sidewalk better. If there's already a bike lane there, but guess what happened, you know, 20 years ago? Well, a lot of this infrastructure wasn't there. So if there's already something there, and that's one of the triggers to build something or make it better, uh, so communities have to interject their opinion in there. There's also other elements in there. Uh, is there activity there now? Well, 10 years ago, 
a transportation planner would go out there and he would look at the job site and he'd be like, nope, nobody's biking or walking. Guess what? No. You know, we need, don't need to do anything. The reason that people weren't biking or walking 20 years ago is because, like I said, 85% of the population doesn't feel comfortable really biking or walking out like on the road with cars. So unless they were crazy people like you, and I know I was one of those people out there 20 years ago riding my bike. So you have to prove that people are going to walk a bike out there. You have to use data to make the decision for what is needed out there. So what we started doing about six years ago was using other creative forms of data to prove that we need to accommodate for bicycles and walking. Who here uses Strava? I'm not really plugging Strava. I have no vested interest in Strava, but they are the only uh, worldwide application that tracks movement for walking and bicycling. And they share a lot of that data with transportation cabinets and people like me. So I use that data a lot to prove that people already might have walked there. I've had county judges tell me, well, nobody walks here or nobody bikes here, so we don't need to include that in this project. And I'll very respectful to our elected officials and I'll say, well, sir, I have data on the Strava that shows that somebody bikes or walks here. If you look at the Strava data from my neighborhood in Frankfurt, you can tell exactly where my house is, and you can see exactly what route I take through the neighborhood to avoid the steep little hill, and you can see all the routes that I use the most. So that's the scary thing about Strava, is it does track your movements, uh, but we don't know who that dark red line is, we just know that somebody rides that uh, quite a bit. Uh, we use other data, if the, like I said, if the community has a plan, uh, we use the characteristics of the road, sometimes will let us know uh, if a facility should be there, but we don't just add bike facilities and walking facilities to a project because we think it's a good idea. We try to use a data-driven process to show us that this is what needs to be done based on all this objective information. Uh, this is the Strava data that I was talking about. Like I said, it's a data-driven process. Uh, if you can see, uh, this is the bike map for Strava. This is their heat map, which is one of the free informations that they have. Look at that Lexington, lit up like a Christmas tree. Louisville, crazy. You can see where the urban density is. A lot of those folks are just folks that commute to work every day and use Strava. Look at that Frankfurt in the middle. Frankfurt must have it going on because it's pretty big. Owen County, God level, right next to me. I ride in Owen County every once in a while. Owen County wants me to help them get a bunch of share the road signs. Well, guess what? The data doesn't support it. I have no proof that there's a lot of cyclists riding in Owen County. Here, anybody here ever ride in Owen County? Or maybe two people, you guys are crazy. The road, guess the roads aren't as good in Owen County too, you know what? Nobody rides them, nobody drives them as much. The data doesn't show that they need to resurface the roads as often as they do in Woodford County, Fayette County, and uh, some of the areas other. And this is on-road data for Strava. I love it. Uh, we've been tracking on-road data for cars for about 15 or 20 years. They know how fast a car goes, rate of speed, time of day. They have all, every time you've ever clicked OK on your phone, like they want to use your location for something, boom, your data is safe. And we use that data to prove or to show how we should make roadway improvements for motorized traffic. But now we're using a lot of that same data to show how we should uh, make improvements for bicycle and walking. And it's not just on-road data, it's also off-road data. Uh, this is a skull buster mountain bike area. So when you're planning in a community, it's not just on on-road bicycling or walking that you're planning for, you're also have to plan for off-road. Uh, these are just a lot of the communities and their uh, master plans they have. We have a dedicated page on our website uh, that you can link to to go all the community master plans. Uh, the success, once you have a community master plan, once you have uh, where you want it, how it makes sense, you can't just let that document sit on the shelf. You have to share that information with everybody, your highway department, your area development office, anybody that will listen. Somebody could possibly help you someday you know, get a project done, so you have to share that information with everybody. Uh, less cars, more active people, more active people, more money, lower health care. You guys know, you're already in the club and the course, so you guys know what it is. Uh, hopefully, we can transform those pictures you saw earlier to something like this.
And a lot of communities in the last six years in Kentucky have done that. In my world, we plan for 20 years out. I have gotten projects done in two years, like a shared use path in large town. We planned it, designed it, and built it in two years. Heads were spinning in my world, because they were like, oh, how did you do that? You know, I went and talked to people. It was so good to talk to people. So a lot of our communities actually look like this now. Uh, these are some of the partnerships that we've developed over the last six years. Uh, I knew a lot of folks in the bike and the walk industry before I started in this job. I didn't stop talking to them. I actually said, hey, why don't you help me get some stuff done? So this is just some of the partners we have uh, locally, regionally, statewide, and national. Uh, like I said, it's a data-driven process. I also work a lot with ADA with the walking, so we've changed a lot of our uh, design elements to make those a little bit easier. Uh, there's our uh, website. If you just Google KYTC Bike Walk, boom, we're the first one that pops up. A ton of information on there. Uh, mountain biking is part of the equation. You have to click a bunch of these here. Dude. It's not just this crazy guy racing. You guys know him, he is crazy. And look, there's proof I did beat him once in a race, like nine years ago. Okay, okay mountain biking, uh, you can see Veterans Park. It's smack dab in the middle of a heavily uh, populated urban environment. And guess what? People ride and walk to the mountain bike trips, uh, or there's also walking trips. So when you're planning, uh, sometimes you have to throw recreational riding into the mix as well. Uh, this is an example of how uh, master plans include you know, recreational riding and walking. The uh, city of Frankfurt, you have Capitol View Park, Louisville, you have uh, one, two, three, six parks that have mountain bike and walking trails in. Uh, Lexington obviously has Veterans Park. Uh, mountain biking has uh, also things like the Dawkins Line. My friend Dr. Sheena Brown right there. I think that's you. Okay. Uh, mountain biking, the it's a segue, it's a gateway bicycle drug to road cycling. A lot of my friends started riding off-road. Uh, they started uh, uh, riding in the neighborhoods, the cemeteries, you know, because they weren't comfortable uh, out on the road with the cars. Uh, but once they got their fitness up, they got their confidence level up, they got bored riding the Legacy Trail all the time. And so, guess what? They became road cyclists like this. It uh, builds communities. Uh, kids love getting out on bikes and mountain bikes. So it builds, you want the base of the pyramid to build up, so we want our kids to be riding and walking. Uh, this is just some of the uh, other activities going around the state. Uh, we have a statewide bicycle summit this year, August 16th and 17th. It's going to be here in Lexington, uh, Transylvania University. Uh, there's a dedicated website to it right there. If you just Google uh, Kentucky Bike Walk Summit, boom, it pops up first thing. And are there any questions? I told you I was going to throw a lot out at you. Sort of thing. Uh, this is sort of off the wall, but do you know when the 100 mile loop in Louisville will be completely finished? The 100 mile loop in Louisville uh, is about 15 plus years in the planning now. Uh, they have 45 miles of it officially done now. And hopefully, all of that will be done before I pass away. <laughs> is that a big answer? Uh, the planning elements have about 90-95% of the loop is planned, uh, but when they work on things like a 100 mile loop around the city, uh, to make it more cost effective and uh, constructible, they have to incorporate a lot of that in other work. So it just takes a long time to do that. Uh, but if you don't plan for it, it'll never happen. The old saying, what's the best time to plant a tree? 40 years ago. What's the second best time? Today. Two questions unrelated. Yes. The first, is there any way to to you or to anyone uh, petition a road to get repaved that's in very poor condition that we ride frequently? If you use a road consistently and you have data to prove that you and a lot of other people ride it consistently, you have the power to have that either cleaned or resurfaced. That decision is made by, you know, a, a, a small room full of people, and they make those decisions based on the information they have. So if you never contact anybody about what your concerns are, then they don't know that that's a concern, because most likely they are not riding a bike on that road and in their pickup truck or in their car. The so who do you contact? 
Start at the local level. If you have a magistrate, call them first. Uh, the mayor's office, obviously, is a good place to start, but like in Fayette County, the mayor probably gets a thousand calls a day. But start at your magistrate, and right away you want to have data and power. I uh, am this person, I ride at the Bluegrass Cycling Club. We have almost a thousand paid members. Is that right, Patrick? Uh, we do 400,000 miles a year. We're part of the largest bicycling event in the state that generates almost $2.2 million a year total revenue, almost a million dollars just for that one day. If you have all that information up front when you contact these folks, and I'm a big fan of email, because then you've created a document, boom. Hey, I told you that road needed resurfaced. What was your second? Second question. Um, big supporter of the, the bike paths, or the bike lanes, right, on highways. On Shinaway, could you please explain to me, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, because you live in Frankfurt. I rode that road a lot, for me. But it, the way they've designated it, I don't understand why they did what they did. And to me, they've made it worse than making it better, because now it's dirty, you have to stay in it, and it's, so everybody, every time we ride Shinaway, we move out of it, and we take a road that's, that's already been, no, it's on Shinaway. It's, uh, it's already reduced, it go, it, we, we're, we move out into the actual road itself. Some so cities, there's well, a her there's question a is, uh, her question is, when a roadway is changed, and in some cities like Lexington, and other cities around the country, it's initially perceived that they've maybe not done us a favor when they add a white stripe and they either create a buffer area where cars are not supposed to go or they add a bike lane and when they add that buffer area or where the bike lane is guess what cars are doing what they're supposed to do they don't use it but when they don't use it they don't blow all the debris out of there so all that debris settles in that spot so as a bicyclist as a legal vehicle on the road you're required to ride as far right as practicable it is not practicable to ride in that space one of the issues with that is car drivers don't realize that. They see us riding in the travel lane, and I've been pulled over by an officer because I was doing that, and I had to explain to him what I did for a living, and I was really respectful to the officer. Uh, he was okay with it. Uh, but you have to call your magistrate or the mayor's office and let them know, once again, I'm, I'm one of the thousands of people that ride here every week, and we can't use that space because it's full of debris. Uh, they just need to know that as well. That's one of my uh, kind of uh, hang-ups with dedicated bike lanes because a lot of times they don't get cleaned and so they're not used. But anyway, and a lot of cities like Lexington, they make these improvements and they add those little elements when they can, where they can. And their thought is, we add it now, we make it an existing facility, so the next time we work on the road, we'll just keep making it better and better and better. A Lee's Town Road is an example. You saw the bike lanes that were on East Town Road like four or five years ago. Crazy, but now there's really, really nice bike lanes, even though it's a 55 mile an hour roadway now. Any other questions? Yes. Responsiveness to like a magistrate or really any elected official. If you send them an email with the information that I can empower you to know, and you let them know know all of these things, one to three emails, I usually get a response, depending on the, the community. It's getting better and better and better over years. Uh, but just send the email, uh, CC a lot of people. <laughs> CC important people. And that, then that usually helps the response rate as well. Sure. Yes? What would be, uh, since now that we've, uh, we've overcome the battle of uh, the three foot law, what would be the next natural thing that we should go after or the, uh, the low hanging fruit of something that we could achieve in the near future wow. in this area or the state? And feel free to repeat that. The question was now that the three foot suggested space is now a three foot law for when motorized vehicles pass cyclists. Patrick said, what's the next thing? That, that's pretty big, it's hard to follow. Yeah. It's like, you know, singing after me, it's hard to follow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would table that question for the bike summit and I would ask Sharon Brown, 
that question, and that needs to be answered at the bike summit. What would that be there? I want to see, what would you have for us? What would be, what you have to contact me and get involved, and I'll give you the answer. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, in the back, very back. numbers. Uh, how many people ride a bike like you guys in Fayette County? Uh, no. You contact the president of all the bike clubs. Uh, just recently I wanted to know how much we had improved in the last four years in our state. So I contacted seven different bike clubs and I said how many people are paid members now? How many people were paid members four years ago? Well, they've had a 300% increase across the state in paid memberships to bike clubs. Okay, so you just need to collect numbers, uh, economic data. Uh, you know, we had the Horsey 100 last year, a couple years ago, and they worked with the University of Kentucky to get an economic impact of the Horsey 100, and it was about $2.2 million for the whole weekend. The one day, I think the peak day, was like six or $700,000 is what generated for the city of Georgia. The Redbud Ride in uh, London, that is their single biggest economic event they have for the year. They make more money off of that bike ride than they do the World Chicken Festival. Because <laughs> well, the World Chicken Festival is a lot of local people. You know, they just drive in for the day, they eat a whole lot of chicken, and then they leave. But the people that do these bike rides, they'll come in from out of town, they stay overnight. You go ride 100 miles, you're gonna eat a whole lot of food. And maybe drink a whole lot of beer. Uh, but you just got to track that data. And Dixie has a whole lot of that data because I've dumped a, I've dumped a data dump on her. So. Oh, we do use Strong, but you have to pay for it. And I know you sent these Strong and you can make it. Strava is free. I have a, well, I have a, a premium account now that uh, I talked my work into getting for me. <laughs> but uh, Strava is free. It just tracks your basic movement. It's kind of like your any uh, GPS device. You just upload your data to Strava. If you have a Facebook account, whatever, they have a basic free account. Strava also provides a lot of free data to transportation cabinets as well. Uh, the data they give you that's free is pretty basic. Uh, but if you pay a little bit of money, they actually give you a whole lot of data. They can tell you like for a region or a county or a state, you know, how many people travel, where they travel, rate of speed, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much data they're able to give you. Uh, yes, right here. Is it going to be up to the counties to determine how many uh, these signs for the three foot passing wall that's coming up? The three foot passing wall that's uh, going to be in effect in the next couple months, it is going to be mainly up to local communities to educate their citizens that this is now a law. And there are funding programs and grants available to communities just for that reason. Just like uh, we don't want to throw trash on the streets because it washed into water drains and it gets added through our riverways, and that's a problem. So there's money, you know, to pay for like radio commercials and stuff to let you know that you shouldn't throw your trash out on the street. But communities are able to spread that message themselves. But guess what? I said you guys are empowered. You guys are the people. So if you want that message to be something that the city of Lexington has a radio commercial for, which now the Bluegrass Cycle Club has worked with several of the largest radio stations, and guess what, multiple days a week, I'm listening to the radio when I'm driving to work, and there's a commercial that says, there's a bike road tonight in Midway, and, and so how did that happen? Those two people over there. See, somebody called somebody else, and they said, guess what, I've got an issue find a solution for it. So you guys are empowered for that. But it is mainly going to be up to the populace, the, the communities to do that, the people do that. At a state level, we're going to update the uh, legislative uh, website and make the PDF a new PDF. And that's really from the state level what we're going to be doing. So I live in Madison County, and we need to contact our local officials about this. Is that involved in the signing of Absolutely. Yes. Last question. Patrick's last getting question. close to pull me off here. La we'll be your last question, Dave. Oh, okay. Can you speak more to the community like plan? Who does that? How often is there device? Where do we find it? How can we get involved in it? If 
you go to uh, the KYTC Bike Walk website, has a listing of all the community plans, uh, the ones that are officially adopted by the local government, just like the YMCA in Bergen County did their own plan, but it's a good plan. There's a listing of all those on there. Uh, Fayette County, for example, has an awesome plan. They just recently updated their plan. Uh, in Fayette County, we have a BPAC. It's a Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Who's on the BPAC from here? Or has been a BPAC meetings? Uh, two mayors ago, uh, they developed that committee. They worked with a dedicated uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Coordinator in Fayette County. Uh, Scott Thompson is his name. He's awesome. Uh, but a lot of communities, Frankfurt has an advisory committee, uh, the Walk Bike Frankfurt, communities that have a group of folks that have worked with the local government usually develop some kind of a, a, a board or an advisory committee. If your community doesn't have anything like that, I can give you everything you never wanted to know how to get that done. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great ride. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Thanks.